Well, let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. I'll read from verses 9 to 13. That is our key scripture here. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are looking at the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and verses 9 to 13 is what we are going to look at and study actually. So I began to show you that in Matthew chapter 6, it begins with the word, take heed. It talks about, you know, many things there about fasting and all those things. But it begins like this, take heed. And we are talking about prayer, so we are focusing only on prayer. So he's saying, take heed, that means beware of how you pray. Now, when Jesus says, take heed or beware or be careful of how you pray, the question is, why? That's the first thing I should ask. Why should I be careful? Why should I be aware of how I pray? After all, prayer is something good. So why is it I need to be careful? What is it that I need to be careful about when I go to pray there? And that is what he says there. Take heed when you pray. Why? Because there is a wrong way, a false way to approach God and a right way to approach God. When you approach God the false way, the rewards are very less there. You just get rewards from men. But when you approach God the right way, prayer becomes totally different. It is something wonderful. It is exciting. It is thrilling. And it changes and transforms you. So that is why he says there, take heed of how you pray. Why? Because there is a false way to pray and there is a true way to pray. Approach God there. So what is wrong with the false way? The false way is focusing upon self. The very approach is wrong. See, you are going to God to pray. You are going to him for something, whatever it is. And your focus must be on God, not upon self. So that is the false way. False way is focusing on self. You remember the Jewish people, the scribes, some of the Jews, the scribes and the Pharisees, they went through the street corners, they went to the temple and they went in the synagogue there in the most important places and they prayed. But what was their intention? Their intention is not really to pray to God, that people will see them. People will see them. So they wanted focus, they wanted people to see them and say, oh, what a good religious person to you this person is what a prayerful person see he's standing on the street he's not ashamed and he's praying there that is the false way of praying that means the attention and the focus is upon self you want people to look at you and praise you and comment upon you rather than God but prayer is actually going to God so you need to focus upon him there so the false way focuses upon self and not only that it also gives importance upon the form of prayer and the length of prayer and time. I told you people have a time when they pray. Preachers have taught people because believers don't pray. <laughs> so they said, at least pray, make up time, five to six in the morning or in the evening or the night, whenever you're free, a lot of time so that you will not skip prayer and you will pray. But I showed you, when you fix a time for prayer, the focus is on time. This is what people do. They say, okay, I'm going to get up early in the morning and from 5 to 6, I'm going to pray. So they'll get in, in their room there and they'll start prayer at 5 o'clock. And 6 o'clock, even if they've not finished reading the scripture and not finished praying, because it's 6 o'clock, they will get up and come out. They will just tell God whatever they need to tell God. But they will never take time to listen or to hear to God. They'll just come out of that because it's 6 o'clock. So that is the problem. See, the false way to approach God is you're focusing on time, not on God. So what is the true way to approach God? That is what Jesus says here. He says, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your father in secret. Because he sees you in secret, but when you pray in secret, he will reward you openly. That is the true way of how you approach God. See, you, you, we need to learn how to approach God the right way. Who is God? <laughs> He is almighty, creator. He is the one who created the whole universe there. He upholds everything by the power of his word there. He is not an ordinary person. You cannot just approach him any way and every way. Well, 
you try approaching your boss how do you approach your boss especially when you want his favor <laughs> you don't just approach him you know any way in every way how do you approach a king you can approach him you know how you want and how you wish there is a way how you approach your boss a way how to approach the king especially when you need the favor there then how much more we should learn how to approach god when we go to him in prayer and that is the first thing that christians need to learn approaching god the right way if you don't approach god the right way god is never going to hear you he is never going to answer you that is why you will hear a lot of christian people telling well i prayed and prayed and prayed but god never heard me and never answered me <laughs> i worked as an associate pastor for many years in chennai there and i i visited a lot of people there and i remember people telling me you know one lady who was telling me she had so much of problems so much of problems and she was praying and praying she says i kept praying and praying but i didn't get answers well the reason is this you don't know how to approach god you have not learned from the scriptures how to approach god god is not some ordinary person that you can approach him anyway in every way and you think just because you approach him and just because you go to him and pray to him that he will hear you no my friend there is a way that god has ordained how you approach him he has set the way he says if you need to come to me to pray then you need to come to me in this manner come in this way then only i will give you an audience then only i will hear you <laughs> if not even is not going to even hear you here so what is the true way of praying i told you he said go into your room shut the door pray in secret let nobody see you pray in secret and your heavenly father who is also in secret he sees you praying in secret nobody else is seeing you but then he rewards you and when he rewards you it is open that means everybody will see god's blessing upon you when you spend time in prayer with him that is what he's talking about now i told you this is not literally talking about going into your room and shutting the door no no it's not like that i showed you that before you can go into your room you can shut the door and you can pray for 5 minutes or 10 minutes and then your mind and your thoughts will wander everywhere else so what is it talking about there is simply talking about how you need to learn how to get your attention off yourself get the attention of others and from everything else and focus on god alone that is what it's talking about shut out everything shut out everything from your mind don't focus upon yourself don't focus upon others don't go there and think about others <laughs> worry about don't even worry about your needs shut out everything else because you are going to god to pray there so you need to approach him the right way so that is what it's talking about in other words it's talking about how we need to pay full attention to him is talking about approaching him with the right motive see the motive is important approaching him with the right intent of heart see we look always on the outward we judge people by the outward but god looks at the heart so even when you go to pray there it's not you just standing there and praying or going into your room and praying it is your heart what is in your heart what is the intent of your heart what goes in in your heart that is what he is looking at god looks at the inside of your heart whether your heart is right whether you are coming to him the right way that's what he's talking about here so that is what approaching god the right way means shutting out everything else and just learning how to focus upon god see prayer is not changing god's mind <laughs> some people think prayer is changing god's mind or changing god's will when something does not happen when you don't get something they say oh i go and pray and when i pray god will change his mind who told you so god will never change his mind just because you pray you cannot change god the bible says that he is the same yesterday today and for ever he will never change for you and me he will remain the same so you cannot change the mind of god people think prayer is changing god's mind that means if you ask something and god said no so you pray and you think god will change his mind say okay let's give it no chance then what is prayer <laughs> prayer is rather giving god the opportunity that is what it is giving him the opportunity to manifest his strength his power his love 
and his providence in our life that is what prayer is see when you go in to pray yes you can go in as a weak person as a sick person you can go in as a worried person you can go in with a person with you know anxiety and filled with needs there but my question is what is the use if you go in and pray when you are weak and when you are sick and when you have a lot of needs and are problems and filled with anxiety and then get up from your prayer and come out with the same manner you just wasted an hour of your precious time is that what prayer is about you are worried you go to god you pray and after praying you are still worried you are sick you go to god you pray you come out you are still sick you have needs you go you pray you come out and you're still worrying about your needs here you just wasted time my friend so what is prayer prayer is not that prayer is giving god an opportunity that means when you go and pray it is you are opening up your heart to god opening up your life to god and letting god giving him the opportunity if you need healing allowing him to heal you if you are worried allowing him to heal your mind and give you peace there if you have needs allowing him to give the assurance and confidence that he will meet and provide for every need of yours that is what prayer is so every time i go to pray i'm giving god an opportunity i'm saying god fill me with your strength fill me with your power that's what i'm saying fill me with your love minister your love to me fill me with your providence providence there so when you get up and come out you're a different person that is what prayer is and that is what the bible intended prayer to be there <laughs> so that is the true way of approaching god approaching god with the right motive with the right intent of the heart there <laughs> and not only that approaching god with the integrity with purity of heart because god always sees a heart that is what the right way of praying is last week we look at Matthew chapter 6 verse 8 where it says there therefore do not be like them for your father knows the things you have need of even before you ask him now a lot of christian people are troubled by this verse <laughs> they read this verse and they say well that means i shouldn't ask god for anything <laughs> because it says here your heavenly father knows what you need even before you ask him so immediately the moment they read that verse then they say then i shouldn't ask god anything well the verse is not saying don't ask god anything there because if you look down on the prayer it says there later on in verse 11 it says give us this day our daily bread <laughs> daily bread so there is a need there there is a petition there so it's not talking about how you should not ask god for anything jesus is not saying that then what is he saying he simply saying that every time you go to god in prayer don't go with the long list of needs <laughs> that is what he is saying there you know some people they only go to god when they have needs after the need is met god is someone and they are someone else <laughs> they forget god so that is what he is talking about every time you approach god just don't go to him with a long list of needs oh god i want this i want that i need this i need that a lot of christians are like that every time they only go to ask god for something how would parents feel especially fathers feel if your children only come to you for money <laughs> i know many parents tell me he always comes to me only when he wants money brother <laughs> how will you feel as a father that your child only comes to you when they need money and once they get the money they don't know who you are they forget you <laughs> they're not worried about you they're not bothered about you they don't care about you how would you feel that is what god is saying here he's not saying don't ask him for anything he's not saying you should not ask god no no he's simply saying every time you come don't come to god with a long list of needs why he says because your heavenly father knows your needs even before you ask him what is the implication that the implication is that you know sometimes children they think they are very smart 
they'll do all the mischief outside there and they think well my father and mother will not know i tell you something children your father and mother know everything about you <laughs> because they gave birth to you 24 hours 7 they were with you feeding you clothing you raising you up you can do anything anywhere they'll just look at your face and they'll tell you something's wrong <laughs> they are your parents they know everything about you they know what you need they know what you like they know everything about you, you cannot hide anything from them sometimes you will find children you know when the parents go out especially little ones they'll do some mischief there and when the father of comes home or the mother comes home when they come into this room the child is running into the next room so the father goes there he is running this side wherever the father goes the child is running away why because he has done something wrong he is trying to hide from the father so the father looks at him and knows very well oh you did something wrong what did you do <laughs> because you are running away from me children can't hide anything from parents they think parents don't know oh your parents know everything about you because they are the one who birthed you they are the one who nurtured you they are the one who raised you up there they know everything every need of yours you know they know you need food they know you need clothing they know you need education when you grow up they know that you need to get married they look for a good boy or a girl for they know everything about you and they do it for you that is what jesus is saying here he's saying here heavenly father knows everything about you he knows all your needs even before you go to him and ask him just like how your earthly father knows you it is in that sense that jesus is saying here just like how your earthly father they know everything about you they you know your weakness they know your strength they know everything they know your needs so it is in that sense that jesus is saying here your heavenly father knows everything about you he knows you have needs he knows you need water you need food you need clothing you need housing you need education he knows you need all these basic things so every time you go to him don't just go to him for these basic needs <laughs> then when do you go to him for your needs when you have something big then you go to him lo <laughs> is a big god don't worry about these basic needs it is his duty as a father to provide me who am a child basic needs children it is your father's duty to provide food for you water for to you clothing to you education to you it is that duty you don't worry oh when my father is going to pay the fees when he is going to you know buy me clothes no no you don't worry about that you just eat sleep and study and go to school that's all they provide you all these things so that is what jesus is saying don't worry about the basic things of life don't worry about food don't worry about water don't worry about clothing don't worry about education your heavenly father will make abundant provision he has already made abundant provision for all these basic needs of your life even before you ask him he knows you have need and he has made provision that is what was it is saying let's go further today let's look at verse 9 so he says that in this manner therefore pray in this manner therefore pray in this manner therefore pray means pray like this pray like this method use this module use this pattern this is a pattern this is an outline use this as a pattern or an outline or a module and pray like this jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray pray the right way so he says in this manner pray in which manner and then he goes on to say our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name that is what we are going to look at we are just going to look at those two words today our father we have to look at the full thing our father which art in heaven but today we are just going to look at these two words our father you won't believe me that is so much of truth in just these two words to you it may not mean anything but there is so much of truth in these two words i am not going to deal with it this week next week i am going to talk about it but these are the most beautiful words in the bible it's a privilege it is an honor that god has given you and me the right to address him or call him father you do, you, you your mind will not understand this great honor that god has given us to address him or call him as father 
this is what i'm going to sh- i'm going to talk about it in detail next week but today we are going to lay the foundation of it so he says pray in this manner that means pray like this pray like how how our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name so that is what we are going to look at today so the first thing is how you approach god you need to approach him in the right manner he is god almighty all powerful god the king of kings and lord of lords so you need to approach him the right way so is uh, approach him in a particular way the right way second step is get off your attention don't focus on yourself don't think about others don't think about your needs focus upon god get all your attention away from you yourself and all the things else and just focus upon god that is the second thing and the third thing is what he's saying is after you do all this then you pray like this our father in heaven that is what he says there in verse 9 So let's look at this. Now you may think it's simple. So God says pray in this manner, our Father which art in heaven. You may underestimate these two words. But in the coming weeks you're going to see how beautiful and how wonderful these two words are that God has given us so that we can call him and address him as father. See, you should understand one thing. Not everybody can call or go address God as father. you need to understand that not everyone not every person every human being can call god as father or address him as father no no only those who are his children and then to those who are his children or been adopted in the family of god by putting their faith in christ only those people can call or address god as father that is why i said it is a privilege If you have been adopted in the family of God, if you put your faith in Christ, if you are a child of God, it is a privilege and a great honor that God has bestowed upon you to call him or address him as father because not everyone can do that. The Gentile person cannot do it. An unbeliever cannot call God as father. No, no, only those who are born of God, only those who are begotten of God, only those who are children of God can address God as father. That I want to show today and explain to you. And next week we'll talk about these two beautiful words and what it really means. Next week is going to be wonderful. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. you receive the spirit of adoption see all those who have been adopted into the family of god by receiving god's spirit <laughs> that's what is talking about you receive the spirit of adoption god's spirit has come into you and that is why you have been adopted into the family of god only those who are adopted in the family of god only they can call or address god have a father that's what he's saying there I like the amplified version. The amplified it is more precise. It says there, and you have now received the spirit of adoption, the spirit producing sonship. It's more precise. That means the moment God's spirit comes in you, you have been adopted. You have received the spirit of sonship. You have become a son and a daughter of God. That is what Romans 8:15 says there. See unless you are adopted in the family of God God becomes your father and you become his child everyone understands adoption you suppose you no know, parents don't have children for many years they go and they adopt children then so that child now legally can address the parents the father call him father because he's been adopted into the family now the child becomes part of the family And that is what Romans 8:15 says the moment god's spirit comes into a person there he is adopted in the family of god he becomes a member of the family and then he has the right to address or call god father ab a father not everyone can call god father verse 16 the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of god you want to know whether you are child of god no need to go to any prophet <laughs> hello some people will go to a prophet for everything you don't need to go to a prophet to know whether you are child of god my friend 
if you want to know whether you are a child of god whether you are born of god the holy spirit god spirit that is in you will bear witness that you are a child of god see the moment you put your faith in christ god spirit comes into you he comes and dwells in you through his spirit there and you are adopted in the family of god god becomes your father you become his child you become his son or a daughter there and the holy spirit bears witness with your spirit he will testify and witness and give you the assurance and confidence that you are a child of god you don't need anyone to tell you that the holy spirit itself will witness to your spirit you will know that you are a child of god you can be assured you can be filled with confidence that you are god's child So that is what Romans 8:16 says there. Only those who are children of God, only they can call God father. Not everyone. One more scripture. John chapter 1 verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he became the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Now you look at this scripture carefully and you tell me does everyone have the right to address god as father is everyone his child is that what the scripture is saying is everyone a child of god hello you're all quiet <laughs> no no john 1:12 is not saying everybody are children of god god is the father of everyone no no it's not saying that it says but as many as received him <laughs> received him into the heart received him into the lives there as many as received him to them he gave the right to become children of god so only those who have received jesus into the heart to them he gave the right to become the children of god once again i like the amplified because the amplified is more elaborate and precise here so i'll read the amplified now the amplified version but to many did receive him he gave the authority the power the privilege and the right to become children of god it's very clear scriptures are very clear very plain very simple not every person is a child of god not every human being can address god father or call god father no to call god father you have to be his child to be his child you have to be adopted in the family to be adopted in the family you should put your faith in christ So 112 says there to as many as did receive him he gave the authority he gave them the power the privilege and the right to become children of god so all those who receive jesus as the lord and savior they are the ones who are the children of god they have god has given them the right the privilege and the honor of being called children see this is an honor bestowed upon you and me God calls us children he calls us sons and daughters just imagine that <laughs> we'll talk about that next week he calls you and me sons and daughters we are sons and daughters of the most high god yes he's almighty he's all powerful he's all knowing he's all you know wise everything is fine but more than all that he becomes my father i become his son i become his daughter what a wonder what a privilege it is galatians chapter 3 was 26 for you are all sons of god does it just stop with that does it say everybody is sons of god for you are all sons of god does it stay with that what does it say there what does the scripture say is everyone a child of god or sons and daughters of god everyone that is born into this world are they, do they become children of god no you are all sons of god how through faith in Jesus Christ just because you are born into this world god is not your father just because you are raised in a christian home god doesn't become your father just because you have taken baptism god doesn't become your father just because you go to church you cannot address or call god as father no no for god to be a father and you to be a child you should have accepted jesus christ as your lord and savior When you put your faith in Jesus Christ believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and Savior that he died for you and he was raised on the third day for you 
when you do that that is when you are adopted into the family of god and you receive the spirit of god into you then and you become a child of god you become sons and a daughter of god and thereby you can address god as father and call him as father just like how in the natural only someone that is born from you can address you or call you as father isn't it not everybody can call you father no no only those who are born of you come from you it is the same in the spiritual also only those who are born of god born of his spirit only those who have put their faith in jesus christ only those who have received the spirit of adoption are included into the family of god only they have the right the privilege to call or address god as father not everyone can do that it's very plain very simple that is what galatians 3:26 says for you are all sons of god through faith in christ so how do you become a child of god how do you become a son and daughter of god by putting your faith in christ by believing in the work of the cross there what he did for you there by confessing jesus as your lord and savior that is how you become a child of god that is how you are adopted in the family of god and that is when you receive the spirit of adoption and you become a child of god whereby you can address or call god father isn't this wonderful that you and me have put our faith in christ god helped us to put our faith in christ and we have received the spirit of adoption and that is why you and me can boldly call or address god as father upon the billions and billions and billions of people on planet earth we have the right we have the privilege we have the honor to go to god and call him have our father and address him as father what a wonderful thing he is who are we talking about we are talking about one of the most important greatest person that ever lived and that will ever live that is jesus christ hello it's not easy not ordinary my friend we have the privilege of calling him father because we put our faith in christ we have been adopted into the family of god he's become a father and we have become sons and daughters we have become his children and that is why we have the privilege and the honor and the legal right to call him or address him as father not everyone dare call him father now there is a misconception that god is the universal father <laughs> Uni- uh, this uh, universal father means that he is the father of all human beings you know there are some people who teach this they say god is the father of every human being and i tell you many of the false teachings comes because of a misunderstanding of scriptures they don't understand the scriptures properly so they'll take one scripture out of the context out of the background and they interpret it in the wrong way and that is how false teaching arises say many of the false teaching arises because of a misunderstanding of the scriptures it comes from the bible only if you read the epistles you will know the apostle john talks about it in first john second john and third john and jude it talks about how you know false teaching comes it comes from misunderstanding of the bible somebody takes some verse and they just deviate from it and that is how they enter into false teaching there see to understand the bible you cannot take one verse out of context and out of the background and try to understand it if you try to do that you will never understand the bible you will find that it will contradict many verses will contradict you will find that so you cannot pull out one verse and try to understand no if you want to understand what that verse is saying you have to look at the context you have to look at the background only then you will get the precise right meaning you will be able to understand it in the right way that is why the bible says study and divide the word of truth correctly there that is what preachers have to do then see the bible is like i would say is like a big puzzle let's say you have a puzzle of an elephant you have a picture of an elephant there and uh, you know normally children they they give it to children there so you have all these small pieces so you have the picture there you have to take these pieces and fit it in that picture there so after you fit all the pieces correctly you get the whole picture you get the elephant the picture of the elephant there 
But the thing is, you have to take every single piece and fit it in the right place. If you fit it in the wrong way, other things will never fit there. That's the same with scripture. You cannot take out one scripture and try to interpret it and give meaning to it. No. Whenever you look at scripture, you have to look at it with the entire other scriptures in view, in mind. You have to keep the whole Bible in mind there. That is how you need to interpret scriptures. You just cannot take out one verse and interpret it apart from the context and the background there. That is how many people deviate from the truth and they get into wrong teaching. So how do they get this idea that God is a universal father, that he is the father of all mankind, entire humanity? Where did they get this idea? It comes from the Bible, misunderstanding of the Bible. Turn with me to Malachi chapter 2. That says there, Have we not all have one father? He's putting forth the question, Have we not all have one father? But you need to understand it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with that verse. The verse doesn't end there. After saying that, have we not all have one father? And then he goes on, as not one God created us. So if you go to the context and go to the background, what is Malachi talking about? He is not saying that God is a universal father. He is the father of every human being, entire humanity. No, no, he's not saying that. You know what is he saying? He's saying God is the creator of every human being. It's a big difference. God is the creator of every human being and God as a father to his children. It's a big difference. Every human being is being created from God. God is their creator. But being a father is totally different. That is what Malachi is talking about. He's talking about how God is the creator of every human being. He's not saying God is the father of every human being. No, no. For God to become your father, you have to put your faith in Christ. And then only you are adopted into the family of God. If not, you are not in the family of God. You are outside the family of God. But he is the one who created you. That is what he's talking about then. Let's go to one more scripture. Acts. Acts chapter 17. Many of the wrong teachings comes from the Bible only. That is why it is important what you listen to, where you go, what you hear. 28. And I'm reading the last part of the verse. The first begins with, For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We are his offspring. That means they take this verse and they think Paul is saying, or teaching about how God is the father of all human beings. <laughs> they misunderstand this verse of Paul. They think Paul is teaching about the universal fatherhood of God. How God is the universal father. He is the father of every single human being. They use this verse here. But let us examine the context. Let us examine the background here and see whether Paul is saying that God is the universal father or God is the creator of every human being. That is why I say context is important. So let us look at it from verse 23. Acts 17 verse 23. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. So Paul was passing through that place. And he saw an altar concerning the object of your worship, whatever they worship there. He says, I even found an altar with this inscription. That means they worshipped idols there. And on one altar, there was this inscription, what? To the unknown God. <laughs> so they are worshipping many gods. And one of the gods that they are worshipping is unknown God. How do you worship an unknown God? I don't know. <laughs> But it was written there to the unknown God and people will go there and worship the unknown God. So as Paul was traveling, he sees this. And then listen to what he says here. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim. You are worshiping the unknown God. You don't know him. And that unknown God, I am come to proclaim to you. I want him to be known to you. That is what he's saying here. You are worshipping an unknown God. But I want to proclaim him to you. I want to tell you who is that unknown God. 
that you are worshipping you don't know him but i know him i'll tell you that's what he's saying here and then listen to verse 24 god who owes that unknown god he is the god who made the world and everything in it since he is lord of heaven and earth does not dwell in temples made with hands so is the son known god he is the god who made the worlds he is the god who created the heaven and the earth what is he talking about is he talking about how god is the father of all human beings here no no he is talking about god as the creator of everything he saying this unknown god you know who is this unknown god he is the creator of this whole universe then he is the creator of heaven and earth he is the lord of heaven and earth that is what he is saying there in verse 24 yeah. and then he goes on to say he does not dwell in temples made with hands and verse 25 nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life breath and all things that means this god who created the world who is the lord of heaven and earth he gives life to all things it's talk about how god is the creator of everything there and then listen to verse the next verse 26 it, it is made more clear here in verse 26 and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth he has made from one blood so powerful verse here any religion whatever religion it is if you ask them the roots of it where it all started everyone will go back to adam and eve there's no one who will deny that whatever religion it is the roots will always go back to adam and eve it is only after that they go it goes wrong that is what the scriptures is saying see how accurate how precise the scriptures are that's is what paul is saying he says and he has made from one blood that means from adam and eve from one blood he has made men from every nation to dwell on the face of the earth it is from them every man and woman had come everyone traced their roots to adam and eve there and who created adam and eve god created adam and eve so here in acts chapter 17 verse 28 paul is not talking about how god is a universal you know father of all humanity no no he is talking about how god is the creator of all things he is the creator of this world he is the creator of heaven and earth he is the lord of heaven and earth he is the creator of every human being here it doesn't matter where they live it doesn't matter what race they are god is the one who created them god is the one who gives life to all things so he is talking about how god is a creator not a father to everyone yes he is the creator not a father god becomes your father only through adoption when you put your faith in christ only then he becomes your father see scriptures make it very clear that not every human being can call god father he is not a universal father only if you are adopted in the family of god only if you put your faith in jesus christ only then you are in the family of god and you can address him as father scripture makes it very clearly turn with me to john chapter 8 this scripture is going to shock many of you verse 44 John chapter 8 verse 44 You are of your father who the Hello You are of your father the who God the devil saying so you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him and when he speaks a lie he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it now i'm sure that many of you may have read this scripture see the problem with us is we think we are very intellectual we think we are smart we you know we just read through the scriptures and we think we understand it but i am going to show you that often times we you just rush through the scriptures and you miss out you don't know what it is actually saying you think you know it but the actual thing is you don't know what it is saying and that is why sometimes reading the bible gets dull and boring because you don't know what it is saying 
but once you start understanding what it is saying then reading the bible becomes very interesting it is exciting and thrilling you will spend so much time in the bible that you will not know how much time you spend because you read and you understand and when you understand it will just lift you up it will lift you up it will strengthen you it will put strength and power and lift you up in life so let us look at this verse especially the first part of it it says you are of your father the devil many of you may have read this verse or you may have heard this verse quoted but i want to ask you who is jesus telling here that you are of your father who is he speaking to can anybody give a clue who is he saying to whom is he saying your father is the devil <laughs> any idea yeah he is telling the jewish people <laughs> hello <laughs> people are saying well the jewish people are god's chosen people they are special people and all those things there <laughs> to them were given the covenants god spoke to them but to the very same old jewish pers people here jesus is looking at them and saying you are of your father the devil <laughs> he's saying your father is not god your father is the devil now why did jesus say this to them because they claimed that abraham was their father they never listened to jesus's words this is we have abraham as, as a father and you are saying we are in bondage how can we be in bondage when abraham is our father and that is why jesus said abraham is not your father because if abraham was your father then you will do what abraham did what abraham did he put his faith in god but you do not believe in me you do not believe my words you do not believe in my signs you do not believe my wonders you don't believe that i am god you don't believe that i am the father of one you don't believe it but you are claiming that abraham is your father abraham is not your father that is why he says you are of your father the devil the devil is your father he says <laughs> i mean this must have been a shock that you if you read later it, it angered them they said well jesus is insane he's got a demon <laughs> can you imagine he spoke to the jewish people see it's not just because you are born in a jewish family and raised up in the jewish rituals and traditions that you are a child of god no my friend paul talks about it very clearly in his epistles there it doesn't matter if you are a jewish descendant or physical descendant no no he says those who are of faith are sons of abraham it doesn't matter if you are a jew or a gentile you become a son and a daughter only if you put your faith in jesus christ you can be a jew be born a jew be raised up in the jewish traditions do, do all the jewish practices there and still you can be a child of the devil that is what jesus was saying here shocking it was so blew their minds apart they must have been thinking oh god is our father god is our father we have abraham we have isaac we have moses we have jacob and god is our father but jesus says your father is the devil <laughs> see just because you are born as a jew and raised up as a jew doesn't mean to say you are a child of god no no you have to put your faith in god abraham put his faith in god that's how he became a son of god son of god that's how you as a child of god true faith he was adopted in the family of god he was considered as a son of god god's child now forget about the jewish people many christian people make the same mistake <laughs> low many christian people make the same mistake they just like the jewish people they claim oh god is our father how dare you call god your father on what basis you call god your father you know what they say well my father and mother are christians i am born in a christian home so i am a christian and because i am a christian god is my father who said if you are a christian and born to christian parents and if you have taken baptism and gone to church who said god is your father god doesn't become your father just because you're born to christian parents just because you 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 know been christian in the church or been dedicated in the church there or taken baptism there god doesn't become your father there's no scripture like that many christians they think god is a father 
that is why you will find people they will go and they'll pray you know they will be burdened there they will have needs there they'll go to god they'll cry and they'll pray but no needs met nothing happens they're not strengthened they're not filled with god's strength and god's power they 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 they, they never you know have their needs met then they never get answers they just assume that god is their father they think god is their father because they are born into a christian family raised up in a christian background even taken baptism and they go to church and give their tithe so they think they can call god as father no my friend god becomes your father only when you put your faith in christ the moment you put your faith in christ you receive god's spirit into you that is when you have been adopted into the family of god that is when the holy spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of god jesus is speaking to the jewish people and saying some of them they saying you are of your father the devil they were saying god is our father jesus says no no god is not your father if god is your father then you will listen to me because i am speaking his words i am telling you his things there your father is the devil turn with me to one more scripture john chapter 17 let's come down there verse 9 another verse many people take for granted so jesus is saying here these are the words of jesus he's saying i pray for them i do not pray for the world but for those whom you have given me for they are yours now just listen to the first part of the verse you know when you read scripture you need to understand who is speaking or who has been addressed by these words here so jesus is speaking these words he's saying i pray for them now my question is this who is that them <laughs> we just always read through isn't it we just read it and go through but you need to stop there when you read a verse like that you need to stop there who is that them who is jesus talking about them who is them he's saying i prayed for them who is them if you tell me i prayed for them means i'll ask you who is them <laughs> you will tell me who is them isn't it so jesus is saying here i prayed for them so we need to find out who is that them but then listen to the next verse uh, the continuation i do not pray for the world but for those whom you have given me for they are yours you know i wish every christian reads john chapter 17 thoroughly slowly and thoroughly most amazing portion of scripture talks about it is called the jesus uh, jesus's high priestly prayer every word is so important there there's so much of truth in that in these verses it talks about such great profound wonderful truths there during this passage of scripture here John chapter 17 if every christian read it and if they really understand some some of it at least it will change and transform them jesus prays for them and you know what he's praying for them one of the things he prays that they may be kept safe in this world hello a lot of christians you know what they are praying oh god please take me quickly if they are in problems if they are afflicted with sickness and if they are you know in financial difficulties this is what they are praying oh god come quickly please take us quickly every christian person is in a hurry to go to heaven and everybody that wants to go to heaven i doubt <laughs> because either they'll be in financial debt or something they have problems they cannot bear it that is why they want to escape here and go to heaven i wish such people read john chapter 17 jesus is praying to the father and for who he is praying he is praying not only for the disciples there but he is praying for everyone who will believe in his name you believe in his name you put your faith in his name yes then jesus prayed for you he prayed to the father for you and what did he pray he prayed many things but one of the things he prayed that god keeps you safe as long as you live in this world my question is this will father god the father hear and answer jesus prayer will he answer jesus yes he will answer so jesus prayed for you what did he pray that the father will keep you safe in this world if you really believe it nothing can touch you nothing can harm you my friend it nobody can do anything to you whatever comes against you it is the father's duty to keep you safe just like our earthly father will protect that child 
our heavenly father will protect you and keep you safe no matter what you go through in life no matter how hard and how difficult it is he will keep you safe and he will take you safely through everything that you see you may go through a storm but he will bring you safe you may walk through the fires but he will bring you safe jesus prayed for you i wish christians read john chapter 17 you know they don't understand this everywhere every time they have a headache they have a cold they have a problem they go everywhere and give the head to pray you know sometimes people call up and ask for prayer and i ask them am i the first person you're calling for prayer or did you call anybody else you know what they say i called every pastor in bangalore and you know what i tell them will you never be healed <laughs> you'll be calling every pastor and every pastor will pray but you'll never be healed 20 years 40 years 50 years from now you'll be the same so jesus says that i pray for them who's them if you read the verse you'll understand who's that them there in verse 9 so i pray for them i do not pray for the world is making a difference between them and the world those who belong to the world who is at them those whom you have given me for they are yours so who is jesus praying he is praying for all that, that the father has given him that is what he says there all that you have given me i have with me and not one person will be lost if you have come to jesus given your life to jesus it is his duty to keep you safe till the very last breath of your life and to take you to god It is his duty, his work. He will keep you. If he cannot keep you safe, then nobody can keep you safe, my friend. So who is he praying for? He is praying for all those who will believe in his name. He is not praying for the world. There is a difference between those of the world and those who the Father has given him. That is what he is praying for. See, all through the scriptures we find a clear difference there. God is not a universal father. He is not the father of all mankind. No, he is the creator of every single human being. But if a person needs to know God as father, then he has to put his faith in Christ. It is through faith in Christ that he receives the spirit of adoption, where God becomes a father, he becomes a son and a daughter, and it becomes a family of God. He comes into the family of God. This is how a person comes into the family of God. Now listen to this. this is also shocking <laughs> you know if you come here you need to be ready for some shock some people will get shaken up they you know after listening here they'll go back home and they'll keep thinking and they'll be wondering if i'm saying is right or wrong well that's why listen carefully when we are born in this world when every one of us are born into this world every human being is born into this world we are born as children of wrath we are born as children of the devil we are born as children of the world now you dare tell this to people <laughs> finish they'll get mad just imagine if you tell a parent who, who has a little child just gives birth to a little child <laughs> that this child is born as a child of wrath <laughs> that this child is father as the devil finish those parents will break your head if you tell them that <laughs> because you know very well i know very well Every child that is born looks like a beautiful angel. Children are very beautiful especially when they are small. They are innocent, you know, this they, they look so innocent. They look like a beautiful angel there. So you dare say that that child's father is a devil. <laughs> that child is born with child of wrath, the child of the world and that child's father is a devil. You know, you, you can't say that. It's a very harsh statement there. But I'm not saying it. The scriptures is saying it. and if you don't believe the scriptures all you have to do is wait for that little child that looks like an angel to grow up a little bit then you'll find out whether that child is an angel or the child as the nature of the devil its father you now as a child grows up you know what the child does it will go to school there pinch someone or poke someone and that person will cry out and say miss he pinched me and he poked me and then the miss will ask did you pinch and poke her No miss I did not pinch a book he only poked me that's it Now who taught this child to tell lies Child is an angel Did you teach the child to tell lies No the child learned it 
no tuition for teaching lies why the nature of the devil is there and as the child grows that nature manifest outside that is why we dedicate children that is why dedication is so important because we are acknowledging that this child father is not the devil it is come from god we are setting this child apart from god and not only that so every child that is born is born as a child of wrath born as a child of the world and born as a child of the the devil is a child of the father and that is why every person when they grow up they have to make a personal decision personal decision that means they have to put their faith in christ to become a son or a daughter of god to become a child of god they have to personally put their faith in christ only then they'll be adopted to the family of god only then god's spirit will be them where they can address god as father a personal decision is important every child has to do it when they grow up address god as to address god as father then so the child that is born into this world and born on the wrath child of wrath or the child of the father of the the, the devil is his father now has to be taken from one realm and transferred into another realm because every child is under the power of the devil the devil is a father so god has to take this child from the power of darkness from the power of the devil and the power of sin and satan there and transfer that child into his kingdom that is what paul talks about in colossians chapter 1 verse 13 let's turn there for a moment Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed or translated us into the kingdom of his son of his love what did it talk about Paul is talking about how when you were born you were born under the power of sin you were born to as a child of the devil he was your father you were born into the kingdom of darkness but then god has delivered you from the kingdom of darkness from the kingdom of satan and has put you in the kingdom of god in the kingdom of light but when did god do it how did he do it the moment you put your faith in christ god did it he translated you from one kingdom into another kingdom from one master you've been transferred to another master before the devil was your father but now god becomes your father you become his child how did it happen because you put your faith in him you been not out in the family of god god lifted you up from the kingdom of god darkness and translated you and put you into his kingdom under his care under his provision under his supervision this is what happens this is how a person becomes a child of god so god is not a universal father of all children no of every human being he is the creator of every human being for god to become your father you need to put your faith in christ only then you receive the spirit of christ in you where you are adopted in the family of god god becomes your father you become his child and then only you can go to him boldly and pray to him our father which art in heaven if not you cannot even address him you cannot even approach him so the question is this is god your father can you say yes he is my father i am his child i put my faith in him i have been adopted in the family of god can you say yes i am his son i am his daughter his spirit that is within my spirit bears witness and testify that i am his child are you sure of that that god is your father that you can call him father Oh are you saying well i born to the christian family my parents are christian i went to church therefore god is my father no my friend god doesn't become your father like that you have to put your faith in christ then only he becomes your father then only you are grafted or do- adopted into the family of god only then you can approach him and have the this great privilege and honor to call him as father who is he he is not an ordinary person <laughs> only his children has the honor the right and the privilege to call him as father not everybody so this is the question before you go home you need to decide that whether god is truly your father or not have you put your faith in him or not if you not put your faith in him then better do it today 
Better do it today. So that you are adopted in the family of God. And you can have the right and the privilege to become a child of God. And once you become his child, then you can call him father. And he will meet all your needs. He will watch over you. He will provide. He will take care of you. See, the moment you become his child, it becomes his duty to take care of you. He begins to do it until you grow up. Until you can do things for yourself. Until that he begins to take care. He begins to help you in everything there. Shall we all stand please? Well, parents, children, don't miss next week. Parents, bring your children. <laughs> next week is going to be really wonderful because we're going to look at these two words. Our Father. Jesus said, pray in this manner, our Father. I'll tell you, most wonderful words that you'll ever hear. You'll never hear truths like this. It will change you. It will transform you. It will change your idea concerning God. People have a wrong idea, a wrong concept about God. But that is what Jesus came to reveal. He came to reveal who the Father is like. Father is not just an angry God. A God who will break your head when you sin or do something wrong. No, no. He's a loving Father, a gracious Father, a compassionate Father. And that is what we're going to look at. And that is what Jesus says. God is like this. Pray like this. Our Father. So you got to know about this Father. <laughs> A lot of children, they've been in the home there. But the thing is, they don't know the father. They don't really know him. It's sad. Many Christians are like that. They don't really know who their father is. Yes, they know God as a heavenly father. But they don't know him personally. They don't know him intimately. They don't know about his character. They don't know his heart. They don't know his thoughts about him. They don't know nothing. And that is why we come to the scriptures, to get to know our heavenly father. And when you know him, you'll be the happiest person on planet earth. Both children and parents. It'll be wonderful. I'll just stay with this. Next week we'll continue. Shall we just lift up our hearts and our voices to God and thank him for his word. Scriptures are so wonderful. You know, when you start reading and when you start understanding them, it's so beautiful. You may be down in life. But when you understand the scriptures, it will simply lift you up and take you to the very heavens itself. It will lift you up high above everything. That's what scriptures will do. That is what God will do for you and me. Oh, we just thank you, Father. We worship you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for the Bible, our God. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that helps us to understand the scriptures, that gives us a revelation of the scriptures. Thank you, Lord. And thank you above everything else for this great privilege and honor and the right to call you as Father Akka. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Our hearts are thrilled. It is excited, Akka. It is filled with joy, worship and adoration, Akka. We just thank you for this wonderful gift that you have given to us, Akka to address and call you as father and to take us and consider us as your children, our God. Yes, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, I just pray that these truths will be rooted and grounded and established in the hearts and minds of your people, our God. I pray that everyone will get a revelation of who you really are, our God. And I pray that you'll help them to know, our God, that you, our Heavenly Father, knows everything that we have need of, Akka. And I pray that even before they could come and pray to you, Akka, I pray that you'll meet their needs, our Father, because you know everything even before they ask you. So I pray that the moment they think about something, Akka, the moment they think about a need, I pray that you will meet it, our Father. I pray that you'll bless people, Akka. Whatever the need is, our God, you know it, our Father. And you are a God who longs to meet it. You are a God who takes care and provides and meets every need of ours, our Father. Just come and each and every one of us into your hands. May you continue to lead us, guide us, bless us and make us a great blessing unto this nation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.